And I'll remind you as we're learning these deals. I'll remind you about the Muslim salesmen of the past, the Muslim traders. Even the non-Muslims say so much of Islam was spread by Muslim traders uh, because of their honesty, they say. They were so honest in their deals that they made people embrace Islam. Uh, not just that, though, but the cases, and I think it goes hand in hand. Maybe it's the same thing. These cases, you need to talk to people sometimes. You need to explain to them, no, I can't do it that way. I'm going to do it this way. And that opens the door for you to give people da'wah. So those Muslim traders were making so much da'wah. MashaAllah. The chapter of canceling and finalizing. The author says, may Allah have mercy upon him. If the deal is valid, then it could be binding from both sides. That means neither side can get out of it. So you have to pay attention to those. Because you might do a deal like getting hired where you can't quit and you can't fire. Or it might be non-binding from both sides. So that means either side can get out of it anytime he wants. Or it might be binding from one side and non-binding from the other. That's going to be like collateral. And that's going to be like the deal for a slave to purchase his freedom. We'll see here. Yani. Because collateral, when you put up collateral, once you put up the collateral, you can't get out of it. But the other one can. He can tell you, take your collateral back. Or once you do the contract with your slave to buy his freedom, you can't get out of it. But the slave can quit and say, I'll stay a slave. So it's binding from one side, non-binding from the other side. So we'll start with binding from both sides. They call it lazim. Lazim. So the word in Arabic for uh, binding is luzum. That's the bindingness, the luzum. Anything that's described with this bindingness is lazim. It's binding. So this is lazimun min al jihatain, binding from both sides. So this includes a sale. The sale is binding by one of the two contractors departing the session voluntarily. Yani, as long as you're still in the same session and you don't make any condition of a guarantee, you don't have any guarantee, warranty, that means. You don't have a warranty in your sale. Then as soon as you depart ways, when either one of you walks away from the other, when it's counted that your session is done because you split up, then the sale is binding. As long as you're still in the same session, you can break the sale. So there's something pending there. As long as you're still in the same session. And there's no warranty, which we're going to see. Okay, now we have some talk here about what if someone dies before they separate and the choice goes to the air? We'll skip those details for now, unless you have a question there. The sale is also binding by forfeiting the choice to rescind voluntarily. Yani voluntarily forfeiting the choice to rescind. Put the word voluntarily in the front there. It's clear. Voluntarily forfeiting the choice to rescind. That means even though you didn't separate, you're still in the same session. Because as long as you're still in the same session, then the session is in effect. The session has not been concluded. But if while you're still in that same session, you said, I seal the deal, that means I stick to the deal. I adhere to the deal 
that's basically saying, I forfeit my choice to be able to rescind as long as we're still in the same session without make, without a warranty. I forfeit that choice and I stick to this sale. So by doing that, then this sale is binding from your side. From your side. If both of you do that, then it's going to be binding from both sides. So this is valid for all sides. And one's choosing does not seal the deal for the other, like I just told you. It's only going to seal the deal for you. And when we say, as long as you're still in the same session, you can cancel the sale. If there's no warranty, then it doesn't matter how long the session is. That session could be five days, for example. It doesn't matter if there's no warranty. If there's a warranty, then the session doesn't matter at all. We're going to see. Because if there's a warranty, then the warranty is what ma matters, not the session. Mm. So... If one of the two contractors departs the session voluntarily, then the sale is final. It's binding from both sides. Or voluntarily forfeiting the choice to rescind, that seals the deal for whoever forfeited. Or the expiration of the conditional grace period, that's the warranty. The conditional grace period, that's the warranty or guarantee, if you want. The period starts when they make the condition, which is going to be when they do the contract. The scenario is that someone sells something to you, for example, and you say, uh, I'm interested, but give me three days. Give me a three-day warranty, and if I change my mind, I'll break this sale, for example. So he accepts, says, okay. So now the sale is, as long as you're inside the time, the warranty time, then the sale is going to be binding. It's going to be binding. They say, Ya'ulu ila luzu. It's going to be binding. It's headed towards. It's headed towards being binding. You're in the warranty period. So once you agree to that, and there has to be an agreement, then your grace period starts. Now the session is canceled. Yeah, I mean, the session doesn't matter anymore. More than three days voids the contract in the Shafiri school. This cannot be used in sales that are subject to usury, nor the advance payment sale. They must be finalized before departure. Yes. So if you've been following and you understand how these contracts are going now, and you know about the Reba sales, you have the general rules for Reba sales. And you know about advance payment sale, which should be clear by now. Then if you understand the how those two sales function, then you should understand that you can't have a warranty for those two. How's that? Because having a warranty means that the sale's not final yet. Not until the warranty expires or until you just break the sale. But when it comes to riba sales, that's bullion for bullion or food for food. You know what bullion is. If you want to ask, feel free, please. When it comes to riba sales, bullion for bullion or food for food, then you know that you cannot depart without exchanging. This implies here that the sale is final. 
You can't even depart without exchanging. So this here means that this sale has to be final. This type of sale has to be final. Then there's no guarantee. There's no warranty for it. And for the advanced payment sale, you have to pay up front so that he can deliver later. And when he delivers later, what do you have to do? If what he delivers to you meets the descriptions that you ordered, then you must accept. Must accept. So that means then also this type of sale is final. So there is no warranty for a riba sale, bullion for bullion or food for food. And there's no warranty for advanced payment sale. So the warranty is going to apply to your normal sale. So if you did have a warranty and then it expired, a warranty of one day or two days or three days, not more than three according to Ashafiri, and then it expired, then now the sale is final, binding from both sides. And D, forfeiting the right to breach for a defect. Forfeiting the right to breach for a defect. That means you discovered a defect in your product and you chose to keep it anyway. Once you choose to keep that or otherwise forfeit that right, like you might not have really in your heart accepted this defect, but you didn't jump into action immediately. That's a condition. Soon as you discover your defect, you have to jump into action immediately to cancel this sale or else you will forfeit the right to cancel this sale. doesn't matter when you find the defect. You might find it a long time after you purchased it. Once you discover the defect, then you have to jump into action immediately to forfeit, to, uh, to cancel this sale, or else you will forfeit that right, and then the sale is final. Or if you just simply accept, then the sale is final. What is the defect? The defect decreases the value of the item. Yani, it would be in the value. Meaning, it's supposed to be worth such and such, but it's not. That's where, uh, that's where bootleg uh, and and uh, replicas are going to come in. Yes, question. What's that? What's what's whose job to do? Okay, so it means they're selling as is. They say we have. We have defective merchandise here. You want to buy anything from us, you're just going to buy it as it is. We're already telling you it's defective. We don't even know where the defect is. It's messed up. You want to buy it from us, it's, then that's your business. Then that's valid. As long as it's useful. As long as it's useful. Even in the future. As long as it's useful, even in the future. Huh? The buyer and the seller are the same. Think about them like one thing. The buyer is a seller and the seller is a buyer. When you buy something from someone, you're basically selling him your money. When he sells something to you, he's buying your money from you. What makes the difference between the seller and the buyer is the words only, like the preposition. Like to or from. That's what's going to make the difference between the seller and the, and the buyer. Okay. Uh, so, a defect in value. Defect could be in the value. Yani, how do you pinpoint the defect? Could be that it's not worth what it's supposed to be. Or quantity, something's missing. Or even extra. There might be something extra that could be a defect. Yani, if it hinders the proper usage. Quantity is defective. Hindering proper usage. When that defect is not usually in that type of thing. Be, being very expensive is not a defect. And also, I get this question from time to time. Uh, being disturbed by expensive price, being not pleased by an expensive price, having words for an expensive price, yani non-flattering words, it's not blasphemy. What's blasphemy is to say selling for an expensive price is haram. That's blasphemy. But to say... Uh, 
That's crazy. That, that's not blasphemy. Because it's an expensive price. If someone wanted to sell you some tube socks for $2,000. So you might say, what? The defect would have to be present when you or your agent immediately returned this to the seller. Yanni, you purchased it. You didn't know there was a defect in it. But there was when you purchased it. The defect was present when you purchased it. Then you discovered the defect. So you took it back. And when you took it back immediately, you take it back immediately. This word immediately here goes to the word returns. If you don't take it back immediately, you will forfeit your right to breach the sale, to cancel the sale. And it has to be present when you get back to the seller or his agent. An excuse to delay is like obligatory prayer, eating, bathroom, or fear of danger. Like the right to buy out a new partner. Yeah, I mean, the right to buy out a new partner has the same rule here. Yeah, I mean, getting a new partner is like discovering a defect. Meaning, you're in a partnership, a religiously valid sharika, not what people call partnership. Remember, in our lessons, inshallah, this word partnership means something very specific. Doesn't just mean you work with someone. I'm using the word partnership for the type of deal that's called sharika in particular, exclusively. So you are involved in a valid sharika partnership. And then one of your partners sells his share. Now you have a new partner. Do you have to stand for that? Or is there anything you can do? You can immediately buy out that new partner. As soon as you discover that you have a new partner, you can rush into action to buy out that new partner immediately. And they, they have to accept. If you delay without an excuse, then you will forfeit the right to buy out that new partner. So these two have the same rule. Discovering a defect and discovering you have a new partner. An excuse to delay in both cases is like obligatory prayer, eating, bathroom, or fear of danger, like it's nighttime and it's dangerous in the night where you are. Like the right to buy out a new partner. Yes. The defects by which marriage can be breached. So now, Yanni, we're still talking about defect, but we just shifted a little bit, digressed to talk about defect in a marriage as a part, as opposed to a defect in a sale. The defects by which marriage can be breached are insanity, even temporary. But that means when you get married, as soon as you get married, you discovered that not became insane later. Uh, okay. Let me double check that. Became insane later. Now I'm doubting. For sure, when you first get married, you discovered that your spouse was insane. Husband or wife. Even temporary insanity. You can breach this marriage. Even the woman can't. You can breach this marriage without spending a divorce. What if the person goes crazy later? Can you breach the marriage without spending a divorce? And let me check that. And leprosy, that's a... You know leprosy, that's a skin disease. And Judam, Judam is also some sort of skin disease or goes deeper than skin. It might be necrosis. I'm not sure though. Or perhaps a form of necrosis. Or maybe it's something else. In the dictionaries, like Hans Ware, the translated dictionaries, I always found Judam translated as leprosy. But it's not leprosy. Unless it's a form of leprosy, unless it's a form of it, a variant of it. So leprosy is baros, you know leprosy. That's like old, one might say biblical disease, like mentioned in Bible stories and stuff. Jesus used to, uh, used to cure the lepers. I looked online to see pictures of lepers. So, yeah. These pictures look pretty uh, horrible. MashaAllah. Um, so Jesus, he used to cure the lepers. They had baros, leprosy. The Judam, maybe it's necrosis, but I'm not sure. Anyway, these three, insanity, leprosy, and Judam, the man or the woman can breach the marriage contract for this without spending a divorce 
also impotence. What's meant here is he's he's unable to achieve erection. Maybe it's maybe should be uh, erectile dysfunction. Maybe impotence means can't make a woman pregnant. That's not the defect by which you can breach the marriage just because he cannot impregnate his wife. But the one where he cannot achieve erection than this one, so maybe that's a better word. This is a defect for which the woman can have the marriage breached in the beginning of the marriage, soon as she gets married to him. Yani, if he has intercourse with her one time only, then she cannot use this to breach the marriage. Also, missing penis, that means whatever he has is less than uh, a gland's penis then she can have this marriage breached. Or for the vagina to be sealed by flesh or bone, those are two different ones. For the vagina to be sealed by flesh or bone. So if he discovers that his new wife has this condition, then he can breach the marriage without spending a divorce. But not if she gets an operation to open it. Breaching the marriage for a defect is not a divorce, so it may happen more than thrice. And one would not have to pay any of the dowry, as opposed to whoever divorced before consummation, for then he would owe half. Number two, renting or hiring is binding for both sides and tending. Tending here, that's our word for Musa paw. Musaqa. That's when you're tending to uh, grapevines or date palms in particular. These are binding from both sides. Renting and hiring is the same thing, and tending is not hiring. So we're going to call it tending. So it's not valid to quit or fire. What's the difference, though, really quick here? And we'll probably come back to mention this again. So we have renting and hiring. That's the same thing. But there's some other deals that someone might call renting or, or hiring, hiring. There are some other deals that someone might call hiring. Uh, but we want to use words to separate these religious contracts so they don't get confused. Like tending. Because in our words, we probably would say, did you hire him to tend? Like the tending is the is the task, and what you did was you hired him. So what's the difference though? Then uh, the difference is that tending uh, has some adjustments to it, so that it's not a pure hiring. Amongst those adjustments is that this worker is independent. Here I would use self-managed. That's what we have here written. Self-managed. That's what it means. Independent contractor means self-managed. That means you can't put him under a manager. You can't give him a manager. He runs his own show. He runs his own business. But we're not going to say he works for himself. I'm not going to say it. Let me say it. I'm not going to say that because it doesn't make sense. But that's what people say. I work for myself. But that would mean... You pay yourself. And that doesn't happen or else none of us would have to work. If I could work for myself, which means I pay myself, then why would I work for anyone? That means you don't work at all. You just get money somehow. So I'm not going to use those words. But that's what people understand from it. What someone might call independent contractor. Or what someone might call someone who works for himself. They mean he's his own boss. That's what they mean. He works for himself, means he's his own boss. Self-managed. So that makes it different from just hiring him. Regular hire, you could put him under a supervisor. You tell him, you're going to work. I hire you. You're going to work under this guy. Do what he tells you to do. Also, for tending, the salary is a percentage. Percentage of the yield. For hiring, the salary is not a percentage. It's not valid. Not valid to hire someone for a percentage. 
for hiring someone, you have to give him his exact salary. It has to be known salary, known task or time in exchange for known salary. Tending, the task is known, but the salary is technically unknown because it's a percentage. Whatever the yield is, who knows? Maybe there will, uh, maybe some of the plants will get sick before harvest. You don't know what you're going to get. Uh, and then there's another type of deal. I'll mention it for you real quick here in passing, which is the pirab, profit sharing. We translate it usually as profit sharing. That's when one person has the money and the other person does the trading. That's it. Only trading, not more. We'll come to talk about it. One person has the money, the other person does the trading, and they split the profits between themselves according to their agreement. That's also a percentage. You get paid a percentage. But that one's not binding from both sides. I'm just mentioning it to you so that you separate it from hiring. And separated also from partnership. That's not sharika. So here we have uh, a, what is that? Four contracts we just mentioned. Four, we have a square, Yani, four points. Each one of these points is a different contract. So you have renting and hiring. That's one. You have tending. That's two. You have... Uh, Profit sharing, that's three. And you have partnership, that's four. Renting and hiring, that's not a partnership. And tending is not a partnership. And profit sharing is not a partnership. Yani. Now, I'm not saying you can't use these words when you talk to someone. If you're just talking to someone out and you're doing your own business and you say our partnership or whatever you say, I'm not saying you can't do that. All I'm doing is trying to make sure you don't mix these deals because of yeah, the translation, the, the language barrier. And profit sharing is not hiring. But someone might say that because you have the money and he does the trading. So you might say, I hired him. But it's not Ijara regular hiring. Because you're going to pay him a percentage, so it's not a hiring. And tending also is not hiring because you're going to pay him a percentage. Hiring, the payment will not be a percentage. So among what is binding from both sides is renting and hiring and tending. So it's not valid to quit or fire. Here, the non-Muslims, they differentiated between some rentals and some hiring. I'm not sure how. Yani, they differentiated between some deals that we don't differentiate between. And I don't know, when I say I don't, I'm not sure how, I mean, I'm not sure if they give them different names because of differentiating between them. Which is what? For example, according to Kufar, if you hire someone, you can fire him. Or if you get hired, you can quit. Unless... Yeah, I mean, there's a clause or something, unless there's something in your agreement. But for us, you can't even agree to that. You can't agree to it. It's automatic in the contract. You can't be hired. Uh, sorry, you can't be fired and you can't quit. That's the way the deal goes. That's the type of deal it is. Uh, but on the other hand, when they rent, then if you try to get out of your apartment early, they're going to take you to court. They don't want you to get out early. They want you to... Pay them. They want to be paid for the entire time that you agreed to. They're going to sue you for damages. And, and they will win. So on one hand, they did a rental and forbade quitting. And on another hand, they did a hiring and permitted quitting and firing. And he, yeah. So they forbade eviction and quitting. Eviction and abandonment on one side, but they permitted hire, firing and quitting on the other side. So I'm not sure if they have different words for these ones. But religiously, renting and hiring are the same. So you can't quit and you can't fire. That's, you know, if we're talking about hiring someone for a job. And you can't 
evict someone before the time, like let's say you have a lease for a year and it's been six months, he hasn't paid you since the second month. Now you're in month six. What's your religious duty? Can you kick him out now and say, listen, man, I can't take anymore. You're going to have to pay me. You're going to have to leave. Nope. You can't kick him out because of the lease, your agreement. Now you might say, well, what is someone to do? And then my answer would be for you, that's why renting and hiring is risky. It's a risky deal. Remember, we talked about risky deals. Risky deals are haram, except the risks that the religion permitted you to take. So you're going to take the risk and take it. And if he burns you, he burns you. And then you're going to have to go through whatever you have to go through to get your money. Or get whatever it is you, you deserve. Your work or something. He owes you work, I mean, for example. Uh, so renting, hiring, and tending is not valid to quit or fire. When a specific person or thing is rented or hired and then it perishes, the contract is breached and commensurate payment is due. Uh, now, remember, there's two types of hiring. I think I was saying something when I lost track. Of, I lost my train of thought. Hold on one second. Renting, hiring, uh, tending. Okay, I hope I didn't lose my train of thought here. I feel like I, I missed something that I wanted to get at. So when a specific person or thing is rented or hired and then it perishes, the contract is breached and commensurate payment is due. Meaning what? Meaning that, don't forget, there are two types of hiring. One is hiring and or renting an individual. Hiring or renting an individual, individual worker or an individual house, an individual car. Okay, so when you rented or hired an individual and then this individual perished, then your contract is broken. And then commensurate payment is due. You're not going to keep going until the end of the lease. It's done now or to the end of the agreement. So for example, you rented a house for a year. Let's say, so a year is 12 months. Let's say $100 per month, just to keep the math easy. That means you're going to owe $1,200, $1,200. Then after six months, the house collapsed. So now your contract is done. It's done because the actual item itself perished. So what do you owe? $600 and, and you're done. So I think that's clear. When a specific person or thing is rented or hired, and then it perishes. The contract is breached and commensurate payment is due. In self-management though, which we already explained now what that means, the heir completes the job himself or by another. Uh, so what's the other type of renting or hiring? That's when you hire a company or you hire an agency. Those are my words I'm using here. That's the words that I came to in translation process and thinking about the case. But the Arabic word is ijaratu adhimmah. Ijaratu dhimmah. Dhimmah, the dhimmah is the account or the tab. So it's like you're hiring a tab. It's basically like you're putting money on the tab and you're saying, okay, here's money on your tab. This is what I need from you to get done for me. Not you in particular, though. So you're hiring an agency. This is the self-managed one. You can't put him under a manager because you're hiring his agency. So you can't put him under a manager. Self-managed. He might be hiring people. And then that's his business, not your business. So when you hire this way, then, and then let's say the guy you've been working with, who's, he's the boss of this agency, he died. That doesn't cancel your contract. So in self-management, the heir completes the job, either himself or by someone else. You're talking about this one died. So then what you're going to do, 
then goes to his heir. And he's going to complete that job with his own money or from the inheritance. And then he deserves the fruit that his dead relative agreed upon for the tending or whatever else was. Tending is a deal that requires self-management. And other deals too, not just tending. And there are other deals too that um, you cannot put the person under a supervisor. Please. Likewise, if the owner dies, then his heir will complete the agreement. Let me know if you have any question there. Three, marriage. It's binding. So it's not nullified by lack of support. If he doesn't support his wife, and let's say he's able to, he doesn't support her and he's able to, or even if he's not able to, that's not going to make her stop being his wife. Or abuse, may Allah protect our sisters and our brothers too. It's usually the sisters though to get abused. Yeah, I any mean, women, not Muslims, I mean, just in relationships, but could be men too. Abuse is not going to uh, dissolve the marriage, nor abandonment or disappearance. But uh, there's rules for missing husband, which I need to review so that I can give you very good uh, and reliable presentation. It's a little bit foggy for me, some of those rules. It's not something agreed upon. So I need something very clear for me so I can just be, I can see its edges clearly. But it could be that because the husband disappeared, he's missing, that the wife can get married. But when, how, uh, that's what we need to review. But it's not merely that he's missing that she's not his wife anymore. And one's marriage to another's slave stays valid if he becomes able to marry a free woman. Because he wasn't allowed to marry the slave woman when he was able to marry a free woman. So he married a slave woman. And then he became able to marry a free woman. Will this break his marriage? No. He's still married to that slave woman. But freedom will... There's, there's some things that will break the marriage here. Uh, so we, yeah, I mean, this point number three here, it could stand to have a few more details to show the other side to say, but it will be broken if this happens or this happens or this happens or this happens. So make the offer me, inshallah, I'll fill that in there. Also, dowry, it is not dropped by divorce. Yeah, I mean, you didn't pay her her dowry and then you divorced her, you still owe her her dowry nor by remarriage to the same woman. So you didn't pay her her dowry. Then you divorced her. Then you married her again. You still owe her the first dowry. And now you owe her a second dowry because you did a second marriage with her. Like divorce. Yani, like divorce means here, it's not going to restart by remarrying her. Meaning, you divorce a woman once. She starts her idda. Then... Her idda expired. Now you can't bring her back. So what do you have to do? Marry her again. Now you do a new marriage contract. How many divorces do you have? Two. Remarrying her is not going to reinstate the divorce you used. Also, number five, khula. So he cannot return her. He would have to remarry her. Khula, when he pays, when she pays, yani when he's paid, to release her, then that's binding. Yani, when he accepts that, if he does accept that, then that's binding. And now he can't take her back. She's out. He would have to remarry her, and he can't force her to. No one can. She can only remarry him by her volition. Number six, the gift after being taken with the giver's permission. The gift after being taken with the giver's permission. Uh, with the giver's permission, yeah, because someone might tell you that something is a gift for you. That doesn't mean you can just go take it, just because he told you that. You still have to get his permission to take it. So the gift after being taken with the giver's permission, except from the parent to the child, the parent can take the gift back 
it's not binding when it comes to the parent. And then the last one we'll mention for today, debt transfer. Debt transfer is binding. So if the transferred person goes bankrupt, the one to whom he was transferred cannot go to the transferer for payment. Meaning, if you want to explain to a person debt transfer in easy words, it's easy. A, B, and C. Debt, debt transfer requires three. It's one of the deals that requires three uh, contractors. A, B, and C. A owes B and B owes C. B says to C, I will transfer A to you so that you get what you owe. You get what I owe you from him because he owes me. If that's done with all conditions fulfilled, which we're not covering that for now, we'll see their conditions when we get down to it, inshallah. Then the debt transfer is valid and B, he gets out of it altogether. Now it's only between A and C and that's binding. If A goes bankrupt, C cannot go back to B and say, hey, he went bankrupt. Now you pay me. B is out. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Allah knows best. Next week, if Allah enables us, we'll read binding from one side and non-binding from both sides. And then we'll continue from there, inshallah. Any question? He said, so if there is consummation and is then seen immediately after, for example, that the spouse is insane, then can it be breached? Uh, let me check the detail there about the insanity, inshallah.